they had mainframe computers, though there was no such thing as a PC, okay, personal computer. And in fact, I, I, I was the first person in this department to word process my, my thesis. My doctoral thesis is right and left justified. I did it on the mainframe computer at MIT, okay? And that was back in the, in the early 70s when I remember we got a little computer for the, for the lab. It had 4K of storage, okay? It was a Wang computer. It had 4K of storage. And my first word processor had 64K of memory. And you know, actually, original Apple II had 64K, you know? You don't even know what that means today, right? 64K, <laughs> that's an email. <laughs> anyway, um, in any case, um, No, I know. You ever heard of the Wang Center downtown? The big performing arts center? Okay, well, Dr. Wang sold these little computers, which were, I think we paid like, in 1970, we paid like $4,000 for this 4K computer, okay? It was probably, if you could look at the, the Moore plots and stuff, it probably was a, a dollar a bit back then for memory, okay? <clears throat> its prices come down. Anyway, um, so I have no idea how many people are going to come. That someone emailed me yesterday and said, "Is this an online course, or a live course, or both?" And the answer is, it's both. Um, but the students are more and more turning it into a, an online course, which is fine, um, and we're trying to adapt to that. Uh, and I'll talk about that as we go go on. It's now 9:05, so I can start lecturing. I'm Tom Eager, and the other two lecturers are here. Dr. Simone Belmar, raise your hand so they can tell. Just because he's okay, and he has extra hair. And then in the back, with less hair, is Steve Lyons. Um, they're both MIT. We're, we're all three MIT grads, so far as that goes. Uh, I am. I actually have a permanent office here. The other two. Um, this is a temporary office for Simone for the last ten years, and Steve actually works for a law firm. Actually, the law firm even has his, his brother's name. No, it's actually his name. Um, and Steve will be here to lecture, except when he has to go to lecture in front of the Supreme Court. Are you doing that this year? Oh, see, he already did that. Oh, okay. So what was that case? Oh, oh. <laughs> see, that's what his attorney always wants to know. Isn't it? <laughs> You did win, okay? What was the case? Um, it, it was an intellectual property case. Yeah, okay. We'll talk about it. Okay, he'll talk about it. So you gotta take his course. Okay, if, so the three of us will be lecturing live. There is a sign-in sheet that's going around because I don't trust the registrar. There are, actually in the last couple of years, this room was full on the first day of class with sort of standing room only, and the next day it was down considerably because some students Many students will take this uh, as an online course. You see Brian's in the back and he's videotaping and we have a couple of other students who will be here that I pay. I've been paying students to videotape my class for the last 26 years. And what happened, well, I'll tell the story someday, but um, I was the first person at MIT ever offer credit at a distance, okay? Not was because of me, I was part of an experiment called the Do, Do Something Committee and we actually did something. And I was the one who did the experiment. Uh, video and tutored video instruction is what they call it at Stanford. Um, and they were way ahead of MIT on that. The schedule is every day until we complete. And if you go to Stellar, you'll find a, a list of who's lecturing which day. Uh, this is on Stellar as of about half an hour ago. Um, Today's an intro and we'll all talk. Tomorrow I'll lecture. Thursday Simone will lecture and Friday Steve will lecture. So you'll get one of each of us this first week. And then it goes by who's in town that day, that week. Okay, so the next week, like next week, I'm not around at all. And so it will be um, uh, Simone and Steve. And then the week after that, I do three days. And anyway, um, so you will have to follow. If you're taking one of the modules, each one of us is going to be doing a, a live module, and there's about a dozen or more um, video modules from prior years. 
and I'll explain some of that. The time is 9 to 10 a.m. in this room, and it turns out I get students. How many people here are from the materials department? Okay, great. How many people from mechanical engineering? Okay. How many people from the Sloan School? Okay. Anybody I miss? What department? Yes. Civil engineering. I've heard of that. It's number one, right? Yes. Architecture. Architecture. Great. So we've got four, three schools represented and five departments or whatever. Okay. It's not uncommon. And the one time I can find, other than four o'clock Friday afternoon, to lecture, which I'm not going to do, okay, um, is nine o'clock. And so, but because of that, like a lot of the Sloan people, they have classes at 8.30. They start at 8.30. So, so that's what I made it um, into an online course. It was originally started as an online course back in 1991 or 92, whenever. Um, we will finish the live la lectures in the first half of the semester, actually by before spring break, okay? You'll have papers due. That's what your the uh, uh, assignment is, and I'll give you more details on that. I like to call it flexibility in a stress-free environment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy in a little bit. There are many modules. If you go to the website uh, over the years, and I've got the years that I've listed. The oldest one up here is probably the casting one. There were ones before that for going 25 years before, but they may only go back uh, for these topics for me. And so this is supposed to be a structural materials course, you know, welding, metallurgy, material selection, um, deformation processing, casting. And there's some things that I've been slipping in, like what is engineering, okay? Just things that I'm interested in. And I've been slipping more and more into the um, economic side of things. Uh, so far as that goes. Um, Dr. Belmar has been doing these for a number of years as well. And he uh, tends to be a mechanical behavior metallurgist by background. Uh, but he's been doing structural materials, materials processing. But this year he's going into, well, I'll let you introduce what you're going to talk about this live this year. But it's going to be startups, okay? Neil Jenkins, who's still in Ohio, was one of my doctoral students, and then he went on and got an MD, and one year when I was on sabbatical, he actually taught non-destructive evaluation of the human body. What does a doctor look for when you walk into their office for a physical exam? And I'll tell you the secret. Touch, smell, taste, sound, and what's the other? I don't remember. Okay, the five senses, okay? They use their five senses, and they, they smell you. And there are certain diseases have different odors, okay? So anyway, and he talks about that for 12 lectures. And Steve Lyons has been lecturing a number of times on law and technology, and he's going to be giving those live. And you don't always get someone with his type of professional qualifications um, and practice teaching at MIT. What are your requirements? <laughs> This is a 12-unit course. That means about 36 lectures, live or by video. And that means six modules. The modules used to be 12 lecture modules, and you had to take three. Because the students, and not just the students here, but the MITx students, they want things in smaller bites. And so I guess last semester is when we started this. We're going to six lecture modules. So now you have to take. You have to take 36 lectures and watch them uh, either live or on, on uh, video, and they're all on the website. You just click on eager.mit.edu, and it was updated last night, so everything's up to date. Some of them are double modules because back when we were doing 12, you'll get credit for two modules of your six by doing one of those. You don't have to come to class again if you don't want to listen to the three of us live on the topics we're doing this term. I've had undergraduates take this course three times, not because they had to repeat it, but because you can do different modules. And it actually says that in the catalog. So some students have taken this course. 10% of the undergraduate education has been this course in various forms. 
So you get to design your own course. If you're interested in casting, there's one on casting. I've been talking to Mike Tarkanian about doing one on a six year uh, lecture module on casting, okay, in the future. Anyway, so 36 modules, 36 lectures, six single uh, modules or, um, or double modules in some cases. And when you go to the website and you click on it, it'll tell you all the, all the lectures now are on YouTube. Anybody in the world. I get emails from South Africa thanking me for my lectures, okay? Uh, so I was sort of doing MITx before MITx existed. Um, you've got to prepare a one, this uh, next month. Uh, oh, not this uh, next month, but a one-page outline of each lecture uh, module, and we have some of these on the website, and we can talk about that. But I will talk a little bit later about a lecturer can only get across one or two ideas in an hour. Okay, everything else is just developing those ideas. And you have to learn to synthesize what they said in that lecture, okay? In a, the elevator talk, okay? One or two lines that summarizes what the person described. And it's amazing to me as I review these, students watch the same modules and you read what they got out of it and what they synthesized and they're, it's like they watch two different things. But it's because you see things through your own eyes, okay? And that's fine. I mean, as long as you're learning something, that's fine. So you will have to prepare three to six pages of, by the end of the term, describing what you got out of each, each uh, lecture in one or two sentences. So you can put six or eight of these on one page, and that's why it's, it's not a lengthy assignment, but every time you watch a lecture, just say at the end, well, what did I learn? And write it down and you get to submit it, okay, at the end of the term. That's not too hard. Um, it says a 10-page paper, yes, okay. I don't want more than 10 pages because we have to read them, okay? Um, but it can be on any topic of your choice. I mean, some students do pole vault poles, which are an interesting, com very interesting composite material. Why? Because they do pole vaulting over in MIT track team, okay? Uh, other people do old doorknobs and the designs of in these European, you know, four or five hundred year old European buildings. What did the doorknobs look like? I mean, one student did adobe and I didn't know there were two types of adobe. One made from mud and the other one made from manure. Okay, do you know the advantage of manure adobe? adobe? Keeps the flies away. May smell a little bit. Anyway, um, and then you're going to have to You'll have to have your 10-page paper in, and I've got some dates here later, uh, and by about April 1st, that time frame. And then you will have to review three or four other students' papers, okay, and edit and comment on them, because your papers are going to be published in the MIT series in Materials and Technology, which is a website associated with this course. And if you want to see some previous papers, you can go there and see some of the last year's or the year before's papers. The student has to maintain the ownership but must assign the rights to MIT. Steve can justify all this for me. <clears throat> he helped uh, me get the, uh, the form, but this is one way for you to learn about some of the ownership rights um, that go with things in your rights when you publish things. It should be editable by future students. So, Use Microsoft Word, most people have uh, access to that. Uh, 10 page maximum plus texts and figures and tables, so it could be a 80 page document if you want, but I only want to read 10 pages. You need to re reference your sources in a scientific way. An article, um, paraphrasing a Wikipedia audio, uh, article will not count. And Brian knows how to do the search on the plagiarism websites so we, he actually found four or five that I reviewed and I didn't, I didn't take action last fall, but uh, I spent a little bit of time after he pointed them out to me. Um, I'd like more than just two or three references. I mean, you're, this is all you're really doing for the course is a 10-page paper on something you're interested in. Come on, 
you must be interested in something besides Wikipedia. Okay, okay. And I like, although people have been doing writing an author biography. Tell me who you are, where you came from, okay? That would go on and so other people would know. So the topics really are anything you want. This is something I put together a couple of years ago when we started doing this. Um, but now you can actually go see what other students have done. Any topic you like. And my thesis is you do a better job if you're talking about something that's interesting to you. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with paraphrase, paraphrasing your thesis and turning it into a 10-page document, assuming your thesis interests you. Okay? <laughs> um, don't be too general. I don't want a description of the old MIT joke about the final exam. Uh, it was very brief. It just said, describe the universe and give three examples. Okay? I don't want that. And some people say, well, I'm going to talk about how automobiles are made. Oh, sure. Okay. $600 billion worldwide industry, and you're going to describe it in 10 pages? Only I would attempt to do that. Okay. Um, don't be too broad. Don't try to cover too much. And I want to know what you think. I'm not just interested in your reviewing something. MIT students actually often have opinions and ideas and different ways of looking at things. So I want to plagiarize that from you. OK. Um, so I don't think we need that. So the grading, no, no tests, no quizzes, no finals. Yay. OK. I hated them when I was a student. OK. And so I thought, well, why don't I make students go through it? OK. I don't even like grading them. And I certainly don't like making them up. Do you know how hard it is to write a good thermodynamics question? It takes two days to write an unambiguous question. However, that's why you get ambiguous questions, okay, on your exams. Because it's too hard to write a good question. Okay, so I solved that problem. I don't do it, okay. Uh, your submission, these are the due dates. You're supposed to, by the 23rd, which is not that far away, a half page telling me what you're going to write about. And I don't want, we're, I'm going to describe the universe and give three examples. I want something fairly specific, like how softballs are made, or how softballs differ from baseballs, hardballs, or something like that. Okay, Something that can be done in 10 pages. Uh, there's no issue here of collusion with others. The dean's office sends me, or the chair of the faculty every year, Every semester sends me some. You have to tell the student what is appropriate behavior so that we don't get them sent to the Committee on Discipline for plagiarism or cheating or whatever. How can you cheat on a quiz if there's no quiz? So I, I resolve that problem, OK? Um, there's nothing wrong with talking to your classmates about anything you want in this class, OK? You could learn more from your classmates than you can from the lecturers. Um, Elevate, evaluate on your paper and participation uh, in editing the other papers. Your paper's due by the 23rd. That's right before spring break. That's why I did that. It's not April 1st. It's before spring break. And there's actually some advantages to you for that. Anyway, edits of three or four others. Once you turn them in, we will probably pick topics that have some similarity. And then we will ask a group of three or four students to edit each other's papers. Editing them does, or reviewing them does not mean editing them. You can, you can, you know, point out the typos, but you don't have to rewrite paragraphs. You can just say, unclear, okay, which means they got to rewrite it, right? If it is unclear, I mean, don't just say that to be nasty, okay? Um, and your final paper is due May um, 11th, but the, um, Editing of the others is due on the 26th. So you have about two weeks in there to make the edits of what will go into the, on the website, OK? So it's sort of like doing a review paper of a real published paper in the scientific literature. Yes? No, no, no. The in-person lectures will hopefully be done by March 10th. I mean, February, yeah, March 10th. No, no, it is sort of a half semester class. We front load everything into every day, okay? 
But you don't have to prepare for anything. I mean, we'll give you some reading, but you're not going to be quizzed on it. So if you don't do it, whose fault is that? I mean, I'm not paying tuition. Okay. If I was paying your tuition, I'd want you to do some of the work. But I'm not paying it. I don't even get very much of it. Okay. So it's not, look, if you come to this class because you're trying to please me, then you're just wasting your time. Okay, you should be coming to the class to try to learn something. And that could be a challenge here. But anyway, um, completion of three one page outlines. I already told you about that. That's on the modules. Uh, I said three, I should have said six, three to six, depending on the modules. But it's only supposed to be about three pages total because it's like two or three lines on each lecture. Okay, 36 lectures, you put 12 on a page, that's three, three pages. Okay. So that's what's required. And you have all semester to do it. But if you're smart, you'll, you'll have it all done essentially by spring break. Okay, if you have your 10 page paper done by spring break, you're done, half semester. Yeah, you'll get three or four other papers to read in, in April. It shouldn't take you more than half an hour to an hour to read those three 10 page papers and edit them. And then you will get comments back from the other students it shouldn't take you more than an hour. So yes, it is a full semester course, and there's a whole four hours worth of work second half of the semester, second half of the semester, right? So you're right, okay? Uh, in fact, that brings up the old Joel Moses story. Um, Joel Moses was the pro, was dean of, head of electrical engineering, then dean of engineering, and then um, uh, provost here at MIT back in the old days. And Joel, Joel's now retired, but he was, he, uh, big beard, you know, very rabbinical. In fact, he had some rabbinical training. In fact, they, they always like to tell the story when he was head of electrical engineering, and they had just hired Jesus Del Alamo as a faculty member in electrical engineering. And Joel wrote a letter telling Jesus that he had uh, been, uh, 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 he's being offered the job as an assistant professor, and he says, Dear Jesus, welcome to the promised land, Moses. Yeah, so Joel had some humor. Anyway, Joel, uh, the only time I didn't see him laugh at a joke, he used to have the head of civil engineering tell a joke to begin every engineering council meeting. And this particular head of, electro, of civil engineering uh, was on his last day on engineering council. He was stepping down. And Joel says, well, tell us your last joke. And the guy says, What's the difference between engineering council and a daycare center? And nobody knew. And the answer was, a daycare center has adult leadership. Joel didn't laugh at that, OK? He didn't particularly appreciate that joke. I thought it was a pretty good joke. But getting back to Joel's joke about your right to. So he was telling this story about this, this rabbi who's these two men came to see him, and the first one was complaining uh, about the other, the other person. And the rabbi listens to him, and he says, you're right. And then the other person tells his side of the story, and the rabbi says, you're right. And the rabbi's wife, who's in the background, says, rabbi, how can they both be right? And he says, you're right, too. So you're right. It's a half-semester course or a full-semester course. We're all right. Okay, so those are the five requirements. Um, you will learn something by uh, reading the other students. Yes? You, you have three summaries. So how does that work? I says three summaries. That should, I, I, that's from the old days. I should yeah. edit that three to six. Yeah. Three to six pages of summaries. Okay. So are they a half page per six hours or a full page per six hours? Whatever you want. I don't, I'm trying to get, you to get them down to one or two sentences. Summarize it. I don't want a half page summary on each lecture. Because I got to read it, okay? You got to multiply it by all the students, okay? And from experience, those summaries, some will emphasize the example, some will emphasize the concepts. It is up to you. It is what you're getting out of the class. And it's an opportunity for you guys to take your notes and learn to do that. When you go yeah. Conferences, seminars, or training classes. It's, it's really, it's for, it's for you, yeah. okay? It's not for us. I mean, I get different things out of the lecture. The students learn from each other. Um, and so uh, 
I put, what happened is I put these things in the wrong places. Um, so I will, I will, I'm going to be teaching total quality management, and I'll get to that tomorrow, okay? Uh, why am I teaching total quality management this semester? Because I've been listening to total quality management for years, and once when I was department head 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, I actually had a bunch of undergraduates in the Chipman room, and I said, well, have any of you ever heard of total quality management? What is it? And one of the students says, it's bullshit. And I said, well, you're, you may be right. But why do some of the top CEOs of the, in the country believe it is a revolution in manufacturing? Okay, And so we're going to spend six hours exploring what it is and whether it's a revolution. And the bottom line is, you're both right. Okay, uh, It is both bullshit and it has some real content. And so I'm going to try to help you understand which part is which, okay? And Simone, there you go. He can tell you what he's going to do. Thank you. So a couple of things. First of all, I'm Simone Belmar. I was a PhD here in course three. I graduated in 2006. I worked a lot in consulting, technical consulting for an engineering, a little bit like some of the big ones that you hear, uh, doing a lot of failure analysis, but also involved in project design and modification with respect to materials. So my background, as Professor Eager mentioned, is mechanics and materials. It does come into how I lecture. So in, with respect to what's available online, on the Stellar. Uh, there's a six hour on physical metallurgy. It goes through deformation of uh, essentially metals and plastics, how you, how, why a nylon rope is different than something that's been injection molded, things like that. Talk about heat treatment and corrosion. A lot of people that attended the class over the past few years really like how in two hours I can explain metal corrosion and all those galvanic effects in a simple way. So that's a six hour module that's available from um, the past fall. I did that last fall, so it's very recent. The other six hour that I posted, and those have the notes with them, the, um, the, the PDF of all the notes, it's all in a zip file for each module. Um, so the, the second one is um, structural materials in service. So over there, it's talking very specifically about um, material selection, but then how you specify materials, so how you tell the shop what to use and how to do that. Uh, talks about some of the specific details for processing, and then moves on to more the usage aspects of factors of safety, and then there are examples of failure analysis. So it's a little bit more applied. There's a discussion on welding in there, and it's again it's very all condensed in six hours. So what I'm going to do this semester live, and I, ex I hope for some participation with you, because I am going through a process of starting a company from the ground up. <laughs> and it's not all done, but I've been talking to a lot of people about it, and it's probably a good time for me to have this as a lecture because, let's say two years from now, it's either gonna be really, really good or really, really bad, and I won't remember what has been needed for me over the past three years. So I started three years ago, I have a team, and we're developing essentially a new kind of hardness tester. Uh, it's very different, it works by frictional sliding, to some extent, it's an extension of my thesis. It's a portable device to go out, test bridges, test pipelines for the yield strength, very precise. Um, the, for the market, it's something new because right now they have to do cutouts, things like that. So it's a big, big change. So they used not to have data. Now they can have that data. And we just went from last year. We, our, our sales for the revenue of making this test went from 200,000 in 2016. Last year was 500, and we're definitely going between one and two million this year. So we're just really taking this up, and we're supported by the National Science Foundation. So as far as the content of this, these six hours that I'll give, a lot of it next week, starting Thursday and then a lot of it next week, I'm going to teach you a little bit from personal experience, but also what I've seen and what the National Science Foundation is teaching us, which is very different than what our customers wants to do sometimes. So our customers be like, well, get it done and then we'll talk. No, 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 this is not how it works. If you really want this, you're gonna work with us now. It's, 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 it's how the National Science Foundation 
taught us to do things. And it's, it's a lot of discipline. It's a lot of work to go from essentially nothing to a, a piece of equipment. So it's a test instrument that we're going to talk about. Uh, Professor Eager, when he discusses material innovation, points out that if you're going to put a new material on an aircraft, it's one of the modules over the years, it's going to take more than 10 years, even if the material is ready to go well. That is not how we can function nowadays uh, in, in thinking of innovation. There's not even a large company that's going to put money towards something that may have returned to you. Not, maybe the university, but maybe. Uh, but even that, I don't know. <laughs> so so the, uh, you know, the short uh, time span required to go to an innovation cycle, I believe, is one of the drivers where, where a lot of time it's taken on by small organizations, startup. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I think the main idea is I want to emphasize what everybody will call R&D, research and development. It's such a broad term because it has two completely different concepts. The concept of research, that's relatively fundamental. And then development is just before you're ready to go into operation, okay? So in my mind, between those two, you, you, you do make some inventions. After you've done some research, you, you think about the stuff and maybe you have some great ideas. You have to turn them into a real innovation, so something that is actually practical and serve a purpose. Then you can do engineering to make sure that it's going to fit, uh, fulfill a specific need. And then the development aspect is where it depends which company you work for. But like now, we have a tool. It's been blind tested. It's proven. It works. It's got all the specification. For some of our customers, they still call it R&D. But for them, it is not research. It's development. It's how they can take it into their normal operation. So we're really going to cover a lot of the basics. And it, it, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to teach the class, assuming some of you are going to work for big companies. Some of you are going to become professors. And uh, some of you may be more on the technical side like I have been, so, but I'm going to try to address all aspects. I have a friend who works for a very big consulting firm. They, they buy startups. <laughs> That's what they do. Okay, day in, day out, and they pay a lot. I wish I, wish I was developing something you could buy. Um, so I'm going to describe a little bit the process so you're aware. And, and, and I do want to say it's my strong opinion, if you get something out of the class, that it is a very important part of today's economy at this point, startup company. And that's the belief of the National Science Foundation. So it was really highly supported by the Obama administration. I think it is still supported uh, by the Trump administration to invest in small companies to go and, and, and take a problem and, and resolve it in a time frame that w just wouldn't happen as part of a large organization. So I think that was 10 minutes. <laughs> in fact, let me just, before yeah. Steve gets up, yeah. while we're changing the mics. It was actually about 25 or 30 years ago that some people in Washington did studies and found that all the new jobs were created in small companies. Well, there's a good reason for that. We can talk about why the reason is. But Congress said, we're going to take 10% of all the research money that we give away, and we're going to put it in small business innovation research, SBIR. Well, they've been doing it for 25 years. And they've seen thousands of startup companies. Some succeed, more fail. And the National Science Foundation, which is a big surprise to me when Simone explained it to me, has a course that they force you. If you get a grant, you must take this week-long course. <laughs> and so he's going to give you the abbreviated version of that week-long NSF course, which is based on billions of dollars worth of research in startup companies and what they've learned for 25 years. Okay? So, right? Yeah. It should be interesting. It's called plagiarism. We, we do have SBIRs, actually. Um, we're applying for all of course and get technology. So it's really challenging to do this instrument innovation when in reality the customer, they just want better report and they want this and this and that. They want us to be going to the site without any help. But so we have to bring power generators. So it's, it's the whole game from having the idea to providing it as a service to it. And we have to protect our ideas as well. <laughs> what Steve's all about. Well, well, you may be asking. What is a lawyer doing standing up in front of a material science class? You may, in fact, you may be asking, why do I have to sit through a material science class where some lawyer gets 
uh, to stand up and present something to me. <clears throat> and the answer to that, I hope, is that Professor Eager and Simone and I have identified an important gap in the education here at MIT. While we train you all to be great researchers, great scientists, uh, to be um, the tops in your field uh, in material science and civil engineering, in, in, in all kinds of science, what we don't teach you uh, anything about here is how to protect those inventions, how to protect those ideas, how to protect the innovation that you're taught here, uh, that you're taught to, that we try to bring out of you and tell you to go out in the real world and apply as entrepreneurs. And what we hope to do here is to provide you with the armor plating that you need in order to protect those important innovations, those inspirations, those ideas, the product of your hard work. Some of the ideas you have today may be the best ideas you ever have in your entire life. And some of you here, Simone being, I, th I think, patient zero as far as this is concerned, some of the innovations that they developed as doctoral students here are providing them with a means to make a living and hopefully a very lucrative one um, as time goes on. The things that you learn here you're going to apply hopefully in real life. And the question is, how do you protect those, those innovations, those ideas, that intellectual property? And so what I'm doing here, standing up in front of you, is hopefully providing you with the key to protecting that intellectual property. We'll discuss what intellectual property is, um, how you encounter it. <clears throat> you know, you may find it unusual uh, that a lawyer is standing up in front of you here in a material science class, but let me assure you that from the minute, minute you cross the threshold of the infinite corridor here in this, in this school, you are in contact with intellectual property every step of the way, whether it happens to be yours, someone else's, uh, whether it happens to be published on the walls or appear online or in a book or in another student's paper. You're constantly bombarded with intellectual property and you need to know how to protect yours and respect the intellectual property rights of others. So hopefully what I'm going to be able to do here is construct a course, uh, mold it to your specific circumstances, because if anything, if I've, taught, I've learned anything from, from the years I've been doing this, especially the last six months, where students continue to contact me with their own intellectual property problems, this is something that you may not realize you're encountering but, uh, now on a day-to-day -day basis, but as time goes by, you'll be feeling more sensitive to it, and you're going to find more and more that this is going to be something important to you. So uh, I'm going to design and, and provide you with uh, the information and a course that allows you to protect the inspiration, the ideas, the intellectual property that you, through your own hard work here at the school, uh, are going to be able to develop. And hopefully, like Simone and many others that, uh, that have come through this course, um, provide you with um, uh, uh, a way to make a living uh, as you uh, cross the threshold into um, uh, the real world. And um, I, can only, uh, I can only tell you one thing, that, uh, that you're all very lucky to be in this course. Um, if I were a student here again, the first thing I would do is I would sign up uh, on this list to take uh, Professor uh, Eager's course. Um, he really is um, uh, one, of the, one of the old old-fashioned lecturers here. He's, I call him the Rosetta Stone of MIT. He is the type of professor that I had when I, was, uh, uh, when I was going here. You don't find too many people like Professor Eager nowadays here. Um, some some, he would say that's a good thing, but I say that that's not a good thing. And you're very lucky to be in this course. I think you're going to enjoy it very much. Thank you. Questions? I'll give you a chance to ask questions. By the way, I've never been called a Rosetta Stone. That's a, that's a dead object that no one can understand. You're not old school at all. You're very modern at all. Right. Yes, exactly. question. I worked on YouTube, and it's hard to piece together what a model is. It, it should be clearer now that Neil posted things last night. But yes, uh, if you just go to YouTube, it's, it's impossible. I tried to do that once. I thought, what? But if you go to my website, 
it will give you the YouTube modules and you can click on each one in order and it will say one of 12, two of 12, three of 12, and you can probably figure out the sequence from there. Okay. Okay, yes, other questions? Okay, well you're gonna learn a number of things in this class that hopefully you didn't know. For example, let's say you heard me say course civil engineering is, is number one. Do you know why? Okay. No, 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 there's a reason. Many times there is a reason. The first engineering in the world, I get to tell my, 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 this, if you, some people are going to hear this other times because I tell it every year. I find some excuse to tell it every year. The first engineering school in the world was a co polytechnique in France in the 18th century. And the word engineer in French means maker of war machines comes from the Latin means ingenuity and things like that but in French ingenieur meant maker of war machines and the first engineering school in the United States was West Point in 1797 or thereabouts and for until 1845 the commandant of West Point had to come from the Corps of Engineers okay in 1823 the second engineering school in the United States was formed it's called Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, New York. Anybody from Troy? Of course not. All of you live in a decent neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> but, but Troy developed an engineering program that they called civil engineering to distinguish it from military engineering. Ah, now we know why they're called civil engineers when everybody says it's an oxymoron. Anyway, um, and why, what were they doing in New York State in 1823 that they needed civil engineers? Pardon me? Canal building? Yes, they were building the Erie Canal. Very good. See, things sort of fit together when you understand the context. So in some ways, this is also a history class. But to tell you the rest of the history, history the next school that claims they were an engineering school in the United States was the University of Michigan in 1845. Anybody from Michigan? Well, I'll tell you, they're all a bunch of liars because they didn't have any students except bears and opossums back in 1845 in Michigan. Give me a break, okay? The next engineering school was MIT in 1861, but they didn't have any money um, until the Morrill Act, and that's another story which I won't go into. But in 1865, the MIT was named, or in 1863, after the Morrill Act, they were named the Land Grant College of Massachusetts. They were given some land and they opened their doors right after the Civil War in 1865. And course one was civil engineering, because that's the only type of engineering other than military engineering that anybody knew of. That's why it's course one at MIT. And two, William Barton Rogers wanted to teach the mechanical arts, it's mechanical engineering. And three was, now y'all got it wrong, it's geology mining and things like that. Metallurgy didn't come into the name until 1883. Never mind. Okay. But the next part of the story for you business school guys, I'm going to tell you the origin of Harvard's engineering school. Okay. From 1873 to 1917, Harvard tried to purchase MIT three times. From 1914 to 1917, students were getting a degree from both institutions. They had merged until the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, now we're getting into the law, said you can't use the Gordon McKay trust funds at Harvard. Gordon McKay was a wealthy shoe merchant who gave Harvard $10 million. You can't use the Gordon McKay trust funds to purchase the land-grant college of Massachusetts, which was MIT. So they were shot down. I have also been told, but I haven't confirmed it, the MIT faculty had a vote and turned it down. I don't think that's necessarily true since they had actually merged. But nonetheless, so MIT had just finished building this building. This building was finished in 1917, the one you're sitting in, okay, my office and everything else. MIT was broke. We were bankrupt for having built these buildings. But we got out of bankruptcy because an anonymous donor, later shown to be George Eastman of Eastman Kodak, building six right there is called the Eastman Building. You didn't know that. It has a name. It has a, a little brass plaque of George Eastman. Go touch his nose. Make it shiny. Keep it shiny. 
because uh, other people have been there before you. Anyway, um, so MIT got out of bankruptcy. In the meantime, Harvard didn't have an engineering school. But Andrew Carnegie had given them $100,000 to buy some land in Alston. And so the Supreme Court said they couldn't do it in 1917. In 1921, they opened a building in Alston, and they called it, come on, what's the Harvard building in Alston? It's called the Harvard Business School. Who was on the faculty? Frederick W. Taylor was one of the people on the faculty. He's known as the father of industrial management, also known as industrial engineering. Okay? Harvard never thought they had an engineering school. In fact, back in the 1980s, when they started coming out with the US News and World Report, who's the number one school in this and that, after about five or six years, Harvard actually showed up number eight on the top engineering schools in the country. And Derek Bach was the president of Harvard, and someone says, well, what do you think about Harvard showing up as number, white and number eight in engineering? He says, pretty good, considering we don't even have an engineering school. Okay. So there's, now I can add a little more to this story. What's the current name of the Harvard Engineering School? Holson. Okay. So last Friday night, I was at a, having dinner with some neighbors, and this one person is, he's the Sloan grad I, I mentioned who, who's an MIT, he's the Sloan grad who's now on the faculty at, at Harvard Business School. And um, Harvard has, is building their new engineering campus right across the road from Harvard Business School. That's not just because they had some land there. That was planned. When I was on engineering council back in the 1990s, Joel Moses, who had spent his sabbatical at Harvard Business School, came back to say they're planning to try to create an MIT up the river. And they had these plans back in the 1990s and maybe even before because they were seeing that the world was going towards technology, okay? And MIT had an advantage because we, our Jerry Wiesner was the president of MIT when I was a student. Um, said that MIT is a university polarized around science, which is true. We don't have everything, but what we have is very good. Most of the Sloan School faculty have never been to business school. I can tell you a story about that. But anyway, Harvard decided that to be the best business school in the future, you had to be associated with an engineering school. So a donor, Mr. Polson, gave $600 million or $400 million, I can't remember the number, to Harvard to strengthen their business school. And what did they do? They gave it to the engineering school across the street, and they named it the Polson School of Engineering. I'm sure there was a little more detail that I don't have in all this. But Harvard is in direct competition. Now, this is not the first time they've ever been in direct competition. How many people have ever heard of the Harvard School of Public Health? Yeah. What was it originally? What was its name? It was the Harvard MIT School of Public Health. And someone in the 1920s from Harvard, a Harvard alum, gave them a big pot of money if they would take MIT's name out of it. And Harvard, all through the 1950s, was in deathly fear that MIT was going to start a medical school. But MIT kind of looked at it and said, it's expensive to be a medical school, OK? There's a great story on that. When Chuck Vest was provost at Michigan and was offered the job of being president at MIT, he called up Dave Rigoni. And I've heard this story directly from both Chuck Vest independently and Dave Rigoni independently. Dave Rigoni was a graduate of this department. He went on to be uh, to Dartmouth, to be, I think, dean at Dartmouth. He was dean at Michigan, maybe provost, I think he became provost at Michigan. And he, he, uh, he gave Chuck Vest tenure when he was an administrator. That's when Chuck Vest got tenure at Michigan. Anyway, they knew each other. Rigoni later went on to be president of Case Western Reserve, and after eight years there, he came back to MIT, and we taught thermodynamics together. And he did venture capital in the afternoon. 
he was worth a lot of money. He's still alive. Wonderful guy. If you want to have a lunch with someone, he would love to have lunch with an MIT person just to talk to him. Anyway, so getting back to, um, I was talking about uh, Polson and business schools, wasn't I? I can't remember what I was talking about, where I was going with that story. So I kind of, yes. Because you want summaries for the students for each module. Right. I think the summary for the overall class is Professor Eager values ideas, but he knows from experience that the ideas only worth so much, and you have to pursue it, and that's right. not just to protect it, it's also to take it from an idea to something that you try out and vanity. Right. Oh. And that's a big process, and it's really what makes a difference between something that's successful and something that's happening. Right. So hopefully you'll Thank you. some of that. In. That gave me time to remember the rest of my story. So when Chuck Vest wanted to know whether he should accept the job of president of MIT, he called Dave Rigoni, and Dave said, Chuck, there's two reasons why you should accept the presidency of MIT. One, they don't have a football team. And two, they don't have a medical school. And that was why Chuck Fest accepted the presidency. So MIT didn't start a medical school. Instead, they started the, the Division of Health Sciences and Technology. So you can get a degree at both Harvard and MIT in Can medicine. You all know why I affectionately refer to Rosetta Stone? Rosetta Stone. <laughs> 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 you've been here long enough. You learn all kinds of dirt. So anyway, um, have a good time. We enjoy talking with you. Uh, we'll figure out whether you're online or whether you're live by who shows up in the next few days. Okay? Thanks. And if you come to the live lectures, then